What we're going to talk about today is another one of these controversial topics. And I want to say up front that I have not made any final deliberations about this. But I must say it's, you know, not looking good for the globe team. And I'm referring, of course, to the flat earth controversy. This started flaring up, I think, one of the main people that, that helped get it, you know, going at least within the Christian community, was Rob Skiba, and I'm very grateful to him. I want to say that publicly for all the work he has done in this area. He's, he's a good brother. Uh, but that being said, it is very controversial because, of course, to believe in the flat earth is to essentially believe in something that most people think is absolutely moronic. Some people say it's a psyop that it's something that the, that the Illuminati are using to deceive people. Other people think that you're just an uneducated nut if you believe it. Now, the funny thing is, though, the Bible says this about people that just dismiss things out of hand. Because I've had several people that I've talked to about this, oh, it can't be, it can't be. That's just stupid, you know, forget it. They don't want to hear about it. Proverbs 18.13 says this, he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and shame to him. So we don't want to be foolish. We don't want to run after conspiracy theories unless they happen to be true. But, you know, and I'm going to be quoting this several times throughout this passage, it says in Romans, let God be true, but every man a liar. And if that's what it has to be, that's what it has to be. Okay, there are two ways to look at the question of the flat earth. One is through the lens of scripture, the other is through the lens of science. We're going to look at scripture first. Now, as most of you know, we are very much into the King James Bible. We believe that it is the final authority for doctrine and for correction and so on. And if you believe in taking the King James Bible literally, except where it's obviously in a poetic sense, then you're basically up a creek if you do not believe in a flat earth. Remember, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, all things are established. That's what the word says. And the problem is there are literally dozens of passages in the Bible, King James, that teach a flat earth. And there are none that teach that it's a globe. And we're going to go into that as briefly as possible, but we're going to go into it. First of all, the Bible clearly teaches that the earth doesn't move. 1 Chronicles 16.30 says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. And of course, there's also Psalm 93.1 and 96.10. And we're going, to, we're going to provide graphics with all of these different scriptures on there if you want to take notes. It also says in the Bible in several places that the earth sits on foundation. And of course, astronomy and conventional science says that, oh, it's just hanging in space. It's out there in the blackness of space, you know, just orbiting around the earth. Well, that's not what the Bible says. In 2 Samuel 22:16, we read, and the channels of the sea appear. The foundation of the world were discovered at the rebuking of Yahuwah, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. And I would also direct you to Psalm 18:15, Psalm 102:25, Proverbs 8:27 and 28, and Isaiah 48:13. It also says in the Bible that the earth is supported by pillars. In 1 Samuel 2:8. We read, for the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's, and he has set the world upon them. The earth also has four corners, and you can't really get four, cor four corners out of a ball. Isaiah 11:12, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, hallelujah, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, again, you don't get corners out of a bowl. Also see Ezekiel 7.2 and Revelation 7.1. The earth, next point, 
is also, and this is what it blew my mind when I first started understanding, is covered by a solid dome called the firmament. And I'm going to read out of the book of Genesis here. In Genesis 1, 6 through 8, this is right at the beginning of creation, we read, And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the water. And Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament. And it was so. So, there's something up there that keeps the waters from above and the waters from below separate. Now, uh, there are also some other scriptures, such as Ezekiel 126, and check this one out, Job 37, 18. Hast thou with him, meaning the Almighty, spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass. So it's like, it, we got to realize back in those days, they didn't have glass mirrors. They would melt down brass or copper and make it into a, a looking glass, a shiny metal thing that people could look at. So that's what's being referenced here. And it's saying that it's like a, a brazen bronze looking glass up there. Now, the other thing the Bible says is that the sun and the moon travel around the earth. Now, the term for that is geocentricity. It's the idea that the earth is the center of the cosmos, not the sun. And, of course, that's absolutely contrary to what we've been taught for the last couple of hundred years. In Psalm 19... Four to six we read, their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. And you can also look at Ecclesiastes 1 verse 5. Also, a couple of times, Yahuwah caused the sun to stop moving in the heavens. And most of them know about the story of Joshua uh, in Joshua 10, 12 to 13, but it's all, it's all, there's also another occasion mentioned in Habakkuk 3, 11. And now think about it. If the world is moving, and, you know, astronomers and so on tell us that the world is moving at around 1,000 miles an hour in the spin of the globe, and if he were to stop the globe from spinning, what would happen? I mean, we all, you know, it would be catastrophic to the entire planet. So the only alternative is that he stopped the sun. And, of course, if the sun is not moving, which is, of course, what astronomy tells us, then that whole thing becomes impossible. Now, another thing is nowhere is the Earth called a globe or a ball. Rather, it is implied that it is a flat surface. And I would refer you once again to Psalm 19, 4 and 6, Daniel 4, 10 through 11, Isaiah 40, 22. And this is one that's especially interesting. I'm going to take the time to read it out of the gospel. Because this is one of those things where if you think of it, all of a sudden you just kind of scratch your head. In Matthew 4, this is the, um, the temptation of Messiah. And... The second temptation, I believe, no, it's the third temptation. Uh, yes. The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. This is verse 8. And sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now think about this. How, I mean, you can get, if you go up to Mount Everest, which is the highest mountain in the world, of course, that's nowhere near Israel, um, you cannot, if, if the earth is, is round, you could not see the kingdoms in even like China. But if the earth is flat, if the earth is a plane, then if you were up on top of a high enough peak, you could look off and you could see all the kingdoms of the world, from the north to south and the east and the west. So, that's kind of a hard one to figure out if, if you believe in, that the earth is a globe. Okay, additionally, the earth, we are told, has ends, which a globe would not. A globe would be 
so to speak, infinite, because if you travel far enough in the globe, you're just going to come back to the same point you started. So, in addition to Psalm 19, 4 through 6, which I already read, in Deuteronomy 13, 7, it says, Namely, of the gods of the people which are around you, nigh unto thee, or afar off from thee, from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. In fact, you need to understand all of the people, both uh, the, the Hebrews in the, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the, the Jewish people who wrote the New Testament, they, under the guidance, mind you, the whole scripture was written under the guidance of the Ruach, of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he made the heavens and the earth. You know, Elohim made the heavens and the earth, so he ought to know what they are and how they work. And under his guidance, you know, the Bible was written to explain all these different things. And if you look at the graphic I'm now showing you, this is from Logos Bible Software, which is a very reputable uh, Bible study software company. And you'll see this is what the ancient Israelites believed the world looked like. And interestingly enough, almost everybody back then, this is what the world looked like, according to the you know, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Chinese, the Mesoamericans, and so on. Now, there are people who will get on, you know, people like me, my case, for bringing this kind of thing up because they say it's stupid and it's an distraction it will keep people from getting born again. Well, here's the thing. Genesis, in the creation account, says the earth was created, Genesis 1.1, long before the sun. In fact, the vegetation was created, Genesis 1.11, before the sun and the moon. This is contrary to modern astronomical teaching. Thus, modern science presents a direct attack against the book of Genesis chapter 1. That's right. Almost all believers reject the scientific teachings of evolution for the origins of man. Indeed, many major ministries like Kent Holbein and, and others have devoted their entire lives to disproving evolution and proving that man was created, you know, the way the scripture says, you know, by by Yahuwah in the in the Gani Den, the Garden of Eden. Now, here's my point. These people have devoted their lives to fighting against the lie of evolution. And many people have gotten saved because of it. Now here's my point. If the scriptures are worthy of being defended concerning the origin of humanity, why are they not equally worth defending concerning the origins and character of the earth and the universe? Yeah. That's my question. Is this just some rabbit trail? I don't think so, because if it is, then evolution is a rabbit trail. Mm -hmm. Now realize, if the scriptures are right, and the earth is the center of the cosmos, is immovable and flat, then the entire scaffolding of scientism, atheism, and humanism collapses like the house of cards that it is. Because none of these things could stand up if it came to pass that the earth was the way the Bible says it. Also, realize that science has for generations been promoting the idea that there is nothing unique in the universe, that it's just a tiny blue speck in the vastness of space. Now, I, I'll tell you, I am a science nerd from way back. I mean, I was reading books on astronomy when I was like five or six years old. I was a little precocious. <clears throat> and I was obsessed with this stuff. I loved science. I wanted to be an astronomer. The only thing that kept me out of it was I really stink at math. But I, I loved all of this stuff, and I've always been a fan of science fiction. You know, I loved Star Trek and all that kind of stuff back when I was young. So it's not like I'm an anti-science guy. I'm not. But on the other hand, you know, let Elohim be true and every man a liar. Now here's the thing. Science fiction is built upon this idea that the Earth is just this little teeny blue speck in the vastness of space, with the idea that there are alien races 
more advanced than ours coming here to either save us or teach us or destroy us. I mean, right now, even as I'm filming this, there's a new Independence Day movie sequel about mean aliens coming from some who knows where distant planet to, to smash Earth into smithereens and get back at us because we beat them, you know, whatever it was 20 years ago. So this this whole idea of, al of the minimal aliens coming to the Earth, many people, including myself, I wrote a book, Space Invaders, about this, have been talking about the idea that this could very well be the deception of the Antichrist. That it could be the way that they make all this come together in a way that's believable for a huge number of people in the human race. And please remember, Hollywood is really controlled by the evil. But if the scriptures are and the flat earth and movable earth that they teach is true, then the earth is truly the jewel and the centerpiece of Yahuwah's creation. Indeed, it may be utterly unique in the universe. And again, let Elohim be true and every man a liar, Romans 3, 4. Now, let's look at science. Mm -hmm. Most people will scoff at all this and say, but science has proven the Earth is a sphere. Is this true? Well, there are problems here. I mean, basically, since the time of Copernicus, the idea has been gradually advanced, and of course, in, this, in the previous century, in this century, it's pretty much regarded as as dogma, that the Earth is round and that the, the Earth goes around the Sun. But how, here are the problems. First of all, and other people like, like Rob Skiba and other folks that have been doing a lot more research on this than I have had time to do, have said that there appear to be no, NASA even admits this, there are no genuine pictures available on the web of the globe Earth from space. They're all Photoshopped. They're all fake. Now you think with all of these astronauts and all of these, you know, satellites and whatnot that are supposedly going up there, you'd think we'd have one raw footage of the Earth. And it ain't out there. The other thing to realize is that NASA was and is primarily made up of Freemasons and that many of the founding uh, fathers, if you will, of NASA were Nazi rocket scientists. Mm -hmm. I mean, this ain't good. In fact, I believe I can safely say that almost every guy that walked on the moon was a Freemason. Now, there are scientific tests which show that the Earth is flat. For an example, there's uh, this, this trigonometric formula that they use to determine the curve of the, supposedly the curve of the Earth. Now, there was a fellow I forget his name, over in England in the last century, who essentially had taken a canal and tried to see how far he could go before he would, you could stop seeing the flag on his little boat over in England. It never happened. The other man had a telescope, and his, he went way further than he supposedly should have gone according to the curvature of the Earth. Also, we see numerous examples of people on, on bodies of water that have taken pictures of, of, I think there's a picture of Lake Michigan. 60 miles away you can see Chicago. That should not be possible if the Earth is as round as they say it is. And there's other things that I don't really have time to go into. But then the other, this is the other thing. Empirical evidence shows that the Earth is flat. I mean, since I started researching this, I've been on many plane rides. And I know people say, well, let's go the plane and it's wrong. Well, not really. First of all, realize that the windows on a, on a passenger jet are kind of optically distorted. But beyond that, like I asked, I asked the, uh, the stewardess, okay, how high are we? 17,000 feet, she said. That's pretty good one. You look out there, I even took a picture with my phone. The thing is as flat as can be because it happened to be a cloudless day. It was flat at 17,000 feet. And, you know, what are you going to do with it? Now, when we all know if we, if we live in a place like, you know, we live in the Midwest where it's pretty flat, and you can, you can work a long way, especially if you live in places like Nebraska or Saskatchewan or Kansas, and it just is, you know, I know there used to be a joke, you know, that, that in Saskatchewan, I ministered up in Canada, 
they say that it's so flat up there you can see the back of your own head. Of course, if the Earth is round, which it, it may not be. And again, I'm not being dogmatic about this. I'm willing to admit that I might be wrong. But I'll tell you, it ain't looking good for the globe. Finally, 1 Timothy 6.20, we read, O Timothy, keep that which is committed unto thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and the oppositions of science falsely so-called. Realize that science, or as many Christians are now calling it, scientism, is a cult. It's a system of beliefs. And the word there, in the Greek, for science is gnosis. Strong's 1108. Scientists are mostly Gnostics. What does that mean? A Gnostic believes you are saved by secret knowledge. And see, scientists, whether they're they're astronomers or physicists or biologists or whatever. They believe they are the custodians of these of this esoteric knowledge of higher mathematics or quantum mechanics or, or whatever it might be, you know, that the average lay person cannot possibly understand. And of course they're true. Much of this stuff is beyond I don't claim to understand a lot of it, but I know that the scriptures are true and that anything that contradicts the scriptures, you flush it. Oh man. So that's the problem. We are warned against this in the Bible, especially when scientists use their supposed superior, superior knowledge to oppose scriptural truth, the oppositions of science, falsely so-called. You see, so, down to the last few centuries, science has lied. Yeah. Science has lied a lot. Just a few examples. Science lies about evolution. Science lies about cancer. Science lies about climate change. Science lies about vaccines. Science lies about the unborn in relation to abortion. Yep. Science lies about mental illness and psychiatric drugs. Preach it. And science lies about childhood disorders like ADHD and what the origin is. Plus, of course, many scientists are lying about genetically modified crops because, see, what does this boil down to? It boils down to money. People are getting rich off of all of these lies. Just like, unfortunately, cults like the Mormon Church and the Joe Witnesses and these other groups, and especially the Catholic Church, are getting rich over their lives. What's the difference between a cult like the Catholic Church and a cult like science? The only difference is, is that the one cult is more respectable than the other because in this day and age, we worship science. Scientists, they are like the high priest of the new religion of humanism. Now, let me ask you this. How would it change your view of the scriptures if you knew the earth was indeed immovable, the center of the cosmos, and absolutely, utterly unique? What would that do? More importantly, how do you deal with the cognitive dissonance of believing in the Bible and also believing the scientific tale of a globe Earth whirling through space around the sun. How do you make that fit? I would submit to you, it's very hard to do. Now, let me conclude by saying this. People will bring up a couple of verses where the, it says, like in Isaiah, that, you know, the, you know, the Almighty sitteth on a circle of the earth. See, that proves. That proves that, that the earth is round. No, it doesn't. Because a circle is not the same thing as a globe. A circle is flat. A circle is 2D. It's not 3D. And I don't have the time here in this thing because other people, again, like uh, Brother Skiba, have done a much better job of it than I have time to, to, to go into all the things of how people think the flat earth might work. All I know is it certainly seems to me after literally six or eight, because I, I, I approach this with great care and great trepidation because it goes against everything I believe in. But yet, the more I studied it, the more it seemed to be true. The more I studied the scriptures, the more it seemed to be true. And again, I'm going to take the word of Yahuwah over the word of Neil deGrasse Tyson or all these other monkey men scientists that are dumb enough to believe they came from monkeys. Why should we trust them about the nature of the cosmos? Some people have gone back and proven the fact that, for example, Isaac Newton, who invented the concept of gravity and celestial mechanics, he was an occultist. 
He was not, even though people claim he was a Christian, he was kind of a, what today we would call a new agey Christian. He was into the occult and things like that. And, and so the whole foundation of this might very well be built on sand. And like the old hymn says, you know, on, on Messiah the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that includes science. So, if you enjoyed this and you found it, you know, in any way useful, we would really appreciate your prayers. Please share this. Please subscribe to our channel. And please pray about donating to support our ministry. Thank you very much. Shalom, and may you be richly blessed. Two thirty-five p.m. in Tennessee, December 18, 2015. We'll pull out here now, and I want to just show you that we have the, the sun is shining. Of course, you can tell the sun's shining. So I'll pan over here. No edits, no cuts. It's just a straight, straight pan. Show the sun's in the sky. No big deal. We have the moon and the sun in the sky here at the same time. So I wanted to check... Uh, all the way around the back side of the globe, Australia. Yes, Australia, we have the moon at 52.8%, and uh, it's uh, 4.32.51 a.m. I think the sun will rise. I looked at it, as I can remember, it either said 5.38 a.m. or 5.39, so what's a minute? They can see 52% uh, of the moon in Australia at the same time, apparently, that we can see from Nashville, Tennessee. Let's see here. Yeah, 52.8% also in Nashville, Tennessee at a time of, I think it says 2.54. And I, I may not be getting the times right, but you know they're very close here. Uh, and, then, of course, it's December 18th here. So what I want to get to is a little Google map here and, and show you that there's the United States. I've actually got it marked on Tennessee. And we spin the Google globe around to Perth, Australia. I think it's 11,100-something miles. I'm not exactly sure. But explain to me how in the world, if the moon is in Australia, you can see it in the United States, or vice versa, the moon's in the United States, and you can see it. And Australia. So I got a little experiment here with a with a globe and a moon. We're going to do. There we go. Here comes our moon in. Here's South America. You see the United States rotating around. So everybody's seeing the moon here in Tennessee and the United States also. And uh, as our moon comes around the globe, we see that here comes Australia. And right now, there's no way you could see the moon in the United States, but they say you can. There's no way on a ball that you're going to tell me that you can be on one side of the ball and see on the other side of the ball. I took this outside with a globe, uh, set it up, and even if I get up high or low, and with the globe tilted at 23 degrees, there's, there's just no way. It doesn't matter how far you walk back. To, to look at it, you cannot see the opposite side of the globe. It's not going to happen. Flat Earth, it's over. The moon shows the truth. It is a flat plane that we live on. From Shuttle Challenger, that's what you're looking at in the middle of your screen. I cannot see the shuttle itself. In 1986, the Shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Emerson Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name,
Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon. And she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, CEO of Towson Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger mission specialist, again, hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger mission specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? Part of the team, even though she was not a trained astronaut. She knows where we're going to be standing, how busy it's going to be, um, where she can help, where where we, we need our space, and she has learned an awful lot and become a weird lady with scale and swords and blindfold or Grecian goddess or uh, warrior princess or whatever it is. What makes it legible? And so one of the questions in the book is to puzzle about both its history and the legibility of this which is a marker and of course um, this local county court. Welcome to Feed Your Mind. So with this evidence of the space shuttle that blew up, the Challenger space shuttle from 1986, well, you just saw live footage of it blowing up and the astronauts dying. And I even have a statement from NASA on how the crew died. Um, if you go to NASA's website, nasa.com, um, or nasa.gov, you will be able to look up an article called Remembering the Challenger Crew, and it was last updated just in 2015, actually, and so they'll provide you the evidence that the crew died, and it says that the NASA family lost seven of its own on the morning of January 28, 1986, when a booster engine failed, causing the shuttle Challenger to break apart just 73 seconds after launch. And then it goes on to name off the members who died, the members of the space shuttle who died. And you can see their faces each of their faces and and their names and then you match that up with the uh, faces and names that they've found that people have found recently and I don't know how recently but they've discovered the whole like pretty much the whole crew so now we have NASA confirmation that the crew has died and yet we have the evidence that the crew is still alive so you might ask yourself what was actually going on there and it's quite obvious that nobody rides on space shuttles on those rockets that von braun the nazi scientists created to make believable rockets that were you know, big enough to fool the public that these machines were taking people into outer space. But it turns out nobody dare wants to ride on one of those rockets. Those are unmanned rockets and unmanned space shuttles. Nobody is flying into outer space. It's just a show. So all those times... When people were watching these rocket launches on TV, this one didn't go as planned, which is probably part of the reason why they decided to cancel out the space shuttle missions. And, you know, when I remember when they canceled out the space shuttle missions, it was always like, I was thinking like, why? You know, why would they just quit? going to outer space, I was thinking in the back of my head, you know, just, just thinking, and then you don't think much of it, you know, if it's before this flat earth stuff, you know, there'd be all types of stuff that just seemed questionable about NASA, 
you know, you just, it's kind of like you think about it and then you forget about it just as quick as you thought about it. Because it's like, well, you don't think much of it. But now that this Flat Earth stuff came out, I'm like, okay, so I was actually wondering why would you just quit, you know, the shuttle program? Like, why would you do that, you know? Now it's starting to make sense because they don't want to risk faking stuff like that anymore. And that's why they stopped because nobody was on those shuttles. And it was just too risky to continue to pull off year after year. They did it through the 70s and the 80s. And, you know, that was about it for them. You know, they were, it was time. I think the 90s is when they stopped early 90s, early or mid 90s, and that was it, you know, no more shuttles going to outer space, and yeah, because nobody was on them, nobody was on those shuttles the whole time, turns out people were gathering around, taking their families to watch the space shuttle launch, it was just propaganda, you know, nobody was in those shuttles, and that's just, you know, that's, this is just, you know, at, at this point, it's time for the remaining globe earthers to start really looking into this flat earth stuff because this is just this is it you know this is the this is the video that really really you can't really defend you know i mean nasa said they died <laughs> turns out they're not dead well what's left but to conclude that nobody rides space shows into outer space. And all that money we've been spending on NASA, huh? And and we got all these, you, you know, social issues that we could have been solving for these years. Instead, NASA's been showing us, taking our money and, and putting on a theatrical show for us. This is definitely proof that nobody's been to space. And then you add this with CNN just recently slipping that, oh, yeah, nobody's been to space in 40 years. All of the overwhelming evidence that no one's been to the moon, all the phony um, CGI images of the Earth, you know, all those pictures that everybody thought was real, Day after day, there's the latest space news about Mars and all this stuff. It's just to keep you set on a lie. So, in the near future, I'll be releasing more videos, you know, because I've, I keep getting the question, why did they fake space? And if, you know, well, part of the reason is because they wanted you to believe that you used to be an animal, uh, you know, you're an insignificant accident that evolved and now you're just, you're a human being, but everything is just some big accident and life is, has no meaning to it. That just, that's basically kind of, you know, the, the idea of what they wanted to present to mankind. And, every, you know, a lot of people feel for it. I guess most people feel for it. And it was the great deception. Space was the great deception. And they, it was for reasons that makes a lot of sense once you start thinking about it, why they would do this. It was to hide who you are, who you really are, and what we are as human beings. You know, our true, you know, our true story of what we are and how we came to be has been hidden from us. You know, they want you to think something else. Well, we'll save the rest of that for another video. Thank you for tuning in. This has been another episode of Feed Your Mind and another Flat Earth Proof. They're faking space to hide flat earth.
I was taking a little gander at Lockheed Martin's YouTube channel. There is something out there called the International Ellipsoid Reference System. I'll say it again. International Ellipsoid Reference System. Which is dis which discusses flattening. Okay? Flattening. We're all clear. NASA knows what the shape of the Earth is. DARPA knows what the shape of the Earth is. And so was the executive administration for the President of the United States. They all agree what the shape of the Earth is. And then I'm going to show you something that Lockheed actually illustrates on with regards to their capabilities on mapping of the Earth. Okay? Stand by. So, what I'd like to show you guys is this. This is the World Geodetic System of 1984, which discusses an ellipsoid. Okay? This is very important. Because these are international reference systems, which are used all around the world. Okay? That's what they are. They're international reference systems. You can find this online at earth-info.nga. Mill. They discuss here the equipotential ellipsoid, okay? An equipotential ellipsoid or level ellipsoid is an ellipsoid defined to be an equipotential surface. Semi-axis is A and B, then enclosed mass. to define which potential parts of the atmosphere were rotating, which caused the stars to move, the moon, the sun, so on and so forth. And here's what they said. The first of these theorems to be stated and proved is essentially its present Form was the one known today as Gauss's theorem or the divergence theorem. The international terrestrial reference system says the IERS, which is the International Ellipsoid Reference System, is in charge of defining, realizing, and promoting the International Terrestrial Reference System conditions. It is geocentric, its origin being the center mass for the whole Earth, including oceans and atmosphere. You have people out there who will say it's a globe, it's a ball. It's not a ball, okay? It's a flattening ellipsoid the flat plane surface in the middle. Okay? Flat plane surface. And just to prove that to you is this. Defining the parameters. WGS identifies four defining parameters. These are the semi-major axis of the WGS 84 ellipsoid. The flattening factor of the Earth. There shouldn't be any argument there, people. The whole planet is not moving. That's, that's a given. We're fixed. We're on a fixed flat plane. The moon is not creating the tidal waves. 
it's the nominal mean angular velocity of the outer layers that are letting that are allowing the waters to recede and come back onto shore. So I'm going to show you this video from Lockheed Martin's website. I mean, not their website, but their YouTube channel. And the name of this video is called Building Amazing. And I want you to listen to what she says with regard to mapping and the image she actually shows. We have been imaging. So she says Lockheed Martin has been imaging. So this cargo ship um, that I'm following here is in real time, and um, we're at uh, the uh, Tampa Bay, and um, we're at um, the Rest Area Park on the south end of 275, um, the bridge. And I'm just going to quickly scan over and show you the bridge. Skyway Bridge, okay, and here's the end of the bridge on the south end, we go on, and we're in the little park, Okay, still in real time, haven't stopped the film, scanning back, and it's not easy to find these boats, so I'm not going to let it get too far away, there it is, okay, I'm going to zoom out where I'm standing, okay, you can barely see it, and now I'm scanning back in, there it is full size. Hold on, let me get her. Okay. And so I'm going to scan back out just a little bit, zoom back out a little bit so that we can watch it full size, just about a close. And I'm going to put it in the left side. Whoop, hold on, lost it. There we go. Okay. I'm going to put it on the left side of the screen here, and it's just, well, you know, this is how you, not easy this is, don't touch anything. Okay, so there it is on the left side, and I'm just going to let it progress across the screen. Long, boring film, but if I cut the film, then I won't be able to prove that I followed it all the way out. There's a boat closer. Now, in the background back there, you can barely see it because it's so hazy here, um, and the heat is uh, starting to pick up, and that also hazes the background, but um, that is, is that St. Pete over there I'm looking at, or is that Tampa? I'm looking at the St. Pete, uh, Florida skyline, and um, I'll put on the screen uh, I'll, I'll overlay on the screen later the exact distance point from where I'm standing to where the skyline is over there. It'll be approximate, but compared to the park where I'm standing and uh, over there, that is not a mirage because I can look right up with my own naked eye and see it over there just as clear as day. So, if I stand back out, and the boat is progressing out to, to uh, into the bay, the port. But I can scan back out and see what you see with the naked eye. And now we're back on the boat. Okay. 
and back a little bit. Still following the same boat. Now I'm going to show you ahead of it what you would see. And that is what looks like a horizon line. What looks like is curvature to our eye because that's what we've been taught to believe that that boat goes and disappears and we can't see it anymore, then it drops over the curvature of the earth. How far would you guys say that boat is out there? Mile, three quarters of the red one. The red boat right there, the red ship. How far would you say that is out there? A couple miles. Okay, pretty big. It's a big cargo ship. Okay, so um, as you can see as I progress the camera and then I scan back, you can see how far away it is. And there she is again. Sorry for the jostling, it's not easy that far away to keep a focus on something. I'm fully zoomed out. Twenty times optical zoom. That's a that's a, a buoy or channel marker out there that I can't even hardly see. It's just a little speck with my naked eye. to have a little trouble zooming out there. And I'm still running on the film, but I'm going to move my tripod because pretty soon I'm not going to be able to see it because there's some vegetation over here to my right. So... I'm going to try to keep it on there. There it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Okay, readjusting the tripod. Yeah, that's not easy. Okay. And it's digging in the sand a little bit. Okay. Now I'm going to zoom back out again, or zoom back in again, and out, to show you how far away that puppy is, okay? Alright, still progressing. So what you're looking at here is uh, what is called convergence. It's not exactly what uh, we've been taught to believe is a horizon line, even though that's what it is. That's created by our perspective, our ability to see. It's where the, where the uh, two different elements meet together, the water and the sky. Those two elements are what makes a, uh, via your perspective, makes a horizon line. And we've always been taught that that's curvature. But what that actually is, is where you have two different elements coming together, is a line of convergence. So if you think about it this way, um, if you had uh, a set of double doors, and um, the line where they close together would be where they converge. So if you took those double doors and you um, turned them sideways, and made a horizon line out of it, that's the line of convergence. So that's what we're seeing here, because if I took this camera and I pointed it up at the sky, uh, there's another boat coming into the picture, coming toward us, interesting. And, um, but let me show you that, if I zoom all the way out, you can't even see that puppy. Barely a sec. 
So there we are. Here's the boat. And you can see the reflection of the heat line on the water. And so it looks like the bottom of the boat is disappearing, but that's, that part is sort of a mirage, the same as you would see on a desert. So um, this line of convergence is where these two elements come together because if I pointed this camera straight up at the sky and focused out on the moon or the sun or something, I would uh, I'd be able to see a lot farther because there's nothing between me and the sky. It's just one element. There is no convergence. So this boat looks like it's sitting kind of almost out of the water and um, the bottom of it is starting to disappear, the red. If you run your film back, you'll see that um, it's a very deep boat as far as the red, the red part of it. But the bottom of it is uh, disappearing into the water, it appears, because the convergence line is starting to eat it up. See how it looks like it's sinking? It hasn't sunk at all. That boat is just sitting out of the water just as much as it was when I first put the camera on it. Now I'm fully zoomed out. That's as zoomed out as I can get. And now let me see how it's sinking into the water. It's sinking into the line of convergence. Because we know this boat isn't sinking or the Coast Guard would have to be called. Okay, now I'm going to zoom back. And you can't see the boat, can you? What happened to the boat? Oh, there it is. Now you can't see any of the red anymore. You can see that glassy surface image where there's sort of um, the mirage part of it, and that's the heat on top of the water and the moisture in the water. So the boat hasn't actually sunk over the horizon. It hasn't gone over the curve. There is no curve, but it, uh, you can clearly see the top of the boat, and that's why they try to tell you that, oh, you know, the boat's sinking over the horizon, and that's why the bottom goes away first, and I'm showing you right here that that's not true. That's not what's happening. The bottom of the boat is being consumed by the line of convergence. Uh, yeah, where uh, where the where the two elements are coming together. So, starting to lose it in my zoom, but you can see that with your naked eye, you already lost it. Okay. And there it is. It's barely the top of it now is showing. But the bay goes on and on and on for miles up in there, headed towards Tampa. So I'm going to hold the camera on it until the line of conversion consumes the boat, not the curvature. Again, I'm going to zoom back out, back in. And there's a guy in a kayak right here in the foreground. And this is the same way the sun seems to sink into the ocean, or seems to sink into the distance into the horizon when it's uh, so-called set. 
hasn't set at all. It's just dropped below the line of conversion. It's dropped below the perspective of horizon. When you look at uh, something, either with a camera or with your naked eye, because they're both lenses, um, it's the equivalent of looking through the bottom of a pyramid, for example. And um, if you took a pyramid and you uprooted it from the ground and you took the bottom off and you look through the hollow pyramid through the point at the end, that is what your eyes see like. You see, it's all, all things come together at a vanishing point. Same thing happens with a uh, train track. Stop walking in front of my camera, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm watching this uh, giant ship sink into the line of convergence out there. It didn't sink into the water because it's sitting above the water it kind of looks because oh boy I think I lost it finally nope there it is there it is again. Hello, where'd the boat go? Hello, there it is. I really got the top left. It's being enveloped by the line of conversion. There's that buoy. You can see that buoy sitting on top of the water. no idea how many miles away this boat is now, but it's out there. I can't see it when I look up. Zooming out again, zooming in again. Hello, bye boat. And there it is again. So the bottom of the boat has not disappeared over the horizon, it hasn't gone over the curve, because if it had, I wouldn't be able to see the top anymore either, because it would be, the top of the boat would be pointing out away. barely even tell it's a boat anymore because it's being hazed out by the atmosphere. So I just told you that right now, that if you just started seeing this image right now, if I told you that was a great big sh uh, cargo ship with a big red hull, you'd go, say what? Kidding me, right?
can see the haze in the water at the heat. Starting to get really hot. Hey you guys, what time is it? Eight forty eight in the morning. And the date is July third, twenty fifteen. And I'm standing in the same spot. I'm probably about uh, three or four feet above sea level where I'm standing on the beach. And that thing is hardly looking like a boat anymore. And it's about to disappear into the line of convergence. Fascinating. Before I became a flat earth believer, I would have never taken the time to do this. I never would have thought to do it. I would have said, look, they're gone. The boat's gone. and went over the curve of the horizon because I was taught I live on a ball, spinning through space. And now I realize that I don't. I was lied to. I was pumped, I was fooled, and I know why. Because if they make me believe I live on a spinning ball flying through space, I'm pretty much at their mercy. Uh, that would mean I just am here because of some big bang thing that happened and because I evolved out of some little pond puppy in the bottom of the muck. It came from an amoeba. So, that just looks like a gray smudge out there on the water. And that looks like a pretty flat horizon line. But until I can't see it anymore, I'm going to let the camera run. That's a boat. That's that big red boat. Still out there. Same boat. Yeah. Same boat. I got a little bit of the top left of it. And that's my science experiment for today. And I'm going to continue to do experiments like this until somebody convinces me that I'm talking here. Little smudge at the top of the boat. And I haven't turned the camera off yet. And I don't have much time left on my battery. But you get the point. There's a boat right in the foreground. See that boat? You can't even see that boat. And there we go. Scanning. I lost it. There's 
सारे हमारे यार कुछ So now you see there's no curvature. There's just a line of convergence. And there you go. And have a nice day. Thanks for watching.